Hello, everybody. This is GM Jesse Cry. Today, I'd like to start a new series on maybe my favorite player of all time, Vasily Smyslov, and in particular, his endgames. And this is something that I think helped me to become a GM, studying his endgames, and in particular, his book, Endgame Virtuoso, which not only had some valuable insights, but just the quality of the games, I felt, helped me understand what endgame play was all about. So I'm going to be taking another look at these games, and I've done so with some of my GM friends. And this particular game is against Sabo, Satsumislav's wife, and this is the Hastings Tournament 1954. And I thought this was an instructive example of the queenside majority and of basic uh, harmonious principles in the endgame in general. So here we go. D4, knight of 6, C4, G6, knight of 3, Bishop G7, G3, castles, Bishop G2, D5. Okay, so this is a familiar way to play for Grunfeld players. Uh, they can't wait much longer for knight C3 to happen. And the point is, is that after knight takes, generally black would like to have the option to take on C3 to get rid of the knight without being pushed in the center. But here black does it anyway thinking that if white plays e4, white will have weakened his center, which is to a certain extent true. So white castles. And now this is this is a line that's still played today. Um, and Smyslov gives knight c6 as the alternative to what black played. And that's, as far as my knowledge, the most, uh, the line that's being played nowadays. But um, Sabo plays a move c5, which is consistent with a lot of the aims of the Grunfeld of opening up the position for the bishop on g7, trying to destroy the white center. And Smyslov initiates here a plan which goes all the way to the end game. we'll see in this game. And um, I think this way of playing was so powerful in the 50s, and it was the reason why Smyslov became such a dominant player. It was so powerful because it was so new, the idea that you could take the game in a very precise way from the opening to the end game, as Smyslov demonstrates in games like this and others that I'll show in the series. So e4 is played. And now, um, if, if a move like knight b6, I can just take on c5, and knight b4 doesn't work well due to a3. So black comes back, and this is consistent of the idea of harassing the white center. Now we see e5, knight d5. Now notice the pawn on e5 can now be a weakness, but at the same time it also blocks in the bishop on g7. And here Smyslov just takes on c5 now. And um, I think it's important to maybe even think about what what the strategy is at this point already. The pawn on e5 is a weakness, but it's important to see that Smyslov just intends to give it away. What he's really imagining here is that he's going to be able to hold on to the c5 pawn, give away the e5 pawn, and have a very nice queenside majority, where his bishop on g2 will really harass the black queenside. And that's exactly what happens here. The problem, uh, tactically, is that if you play like knight c6 now, I can just keep you out of b4 and threaten to play b4 myself. And you can't yet take on e5 because the knight on d5 will be hanging. Okay. So, due to that, Sabo plays knight b4, preempting a3, and maybe having some hopes of coming into d3 himself. So Smyslov simply plays knight c3, knight c6, and now a nice move of queen e2. In a previous game, a3 was played between Botvinnik and Bronstein. But queen e2, we'll see, really is consistent with the idea of just going into the end game because now white's black's only uh, way of playing in, uh, in any kind of consistent way with his plan now is queen d3. Else we're just going to kick him with rook d1. We still play rook d1. Queen takes, knight takes, and as I said before, we give him this pawn on e5. Knight takes, bishop takes. And now let's play one move for white and then try to assess the position. Bishop h6. So um, I played through the opening phase fairly quickly, 
And it's more of this position onwards that interests me the most. Um, like in many top-level games, what we see here is several of the pieces are displaced at the moment. And what both players need to do is find their bearings and try to imagine what the qualities of the pieces are and what both sides should be trying to accomplish. So I think the, the biggest thing to see is that the best piece on the board of the miners is the white bishop on g2. Not only is it enslaving the bishop on c8 to guard b7, but it really exerts so much influence on that area where we were going to want to push our pawns, and we're going to see that that's a continual factor in the game. Um, the bishop on h6, whilst it does do a, a threat at the moment, isn't such a great piece in that it's kind of on the side of the board and it's not helping us on the queen side. The knight on e2 is also a little bit funny. We don't know how it's going to participate effectively in the game yet. Now, the same can be said of black's pieces. The knight in b4 is definitely going to have to go somewhere else. And really, to, it's going to have to trade pieces, trade jobs with the bishop on c8 by enslaving itself with knight c6 to, to block the bishop on g2. But we'll see that even on c6, it's a bit of a target. And obviously, the bishop on c8 wants to come out, but it's not so clear where it should go. Now, on the other hand, I think black's best piece is this bishop on e5, touching our pawn on, on b2 and really controlling a lot of that powerful diagonal. However, because our bishop on h6 is taking away its natural home on g7, that bishop is going to be a little bit uncomfortable. So, first of all, I think Saba makes the correct decision here and plays rook e8. If bishop g7, we simply trade one of our pieces that isn't doing a whole lot for his best piece and continue our aggression on the queen side. So, rook e8 occurs. Now, rook d2. That's a nice move to be able to make. We defend our pawn and prepare to double. Knight c6. And now a nice move which initiates a plan. We play knight f4. So we're letting black know now that we're intending to make our knight useful on the d5 square. Black plays bishop f5. And now most, maybe most players would play rook a d1, which wouldn't be a bad move. But Smisov plays a move that's a very good practical decision. He plays rook e1. And this is going to question the intentions of the, the motive of the, of the bishop on e5, because we're threatening bishop takes c6. And here I think Zabu is faced with one of the more interesting questions of the game. Should he play bishop g7, trading off his good bishop, but activating his king? Or should he play a move, an inconveniencing move, to, um, to shore up his bishop, on that diagonal with like f6, which potentially weakens some light squares, or bishop h8. Very interesting decision. I think Sabo made, them, made a mistake and he played bishop g7. And I think part of this mistake is he's not realizing how dangerous um, the queenside majority is going to be, especially working together with this bishop on g2. So the best move, I think, is f6, and, and black just has to get over the fact that he's got some weaknesses on the light squares, which white really can't do all that much about. And I studied this position at some length with uh, GM's bot and Friedel, and we thought that after rook d1, a variation could go like this, rook a d8, knight d5, threatening, knight takes e7, King f7. And now the move b4. Um, we felt that white had uh, retained uh, an advantage nevertheless. This is very a lot more complicated though and a lot more can happen. And notice too with this move f6 that at some points um, white is really going to have to be scared of the move g5 intending king g6 trapping the bishop on h6. So that was would have been the better try for black. But notice, it's already a difficult position. So bishop g7, 
bishop takes, king takes. And like I said, now it's going to be um, a long road for black because the, those, that pawn on b7 is so weak and uh, it's going to be hard to stop the advance of the white pawns, which Smisov begins immediately with a3. Very nice move. Many people might have just doubled on the d-file immediately. And this gives black kind of an interesting question um, where he really has to start realizing the danger. Um, if he plays rook a d8, for example, he has to contend with losing a pawn after bishop c6, hitting rook e8, pawn takes, rook takes d8, rook takes, rook takes e7. However, losing the pawn like this is a much smaller evil than what's going to happen in the game because here, after a move like g5, even though you've lost the pawn, your pieces have become very active and the light squares around the white king are even a little bit unstable. So this would give black good chances for counterplay. <clears throat> and in fact, what Smyslov says <clears throat> in the book is that there's no way you'd give up the bishop on g2 for the knight, even if he's winning a pawn. And the correct move is rook ed1 where white still retains an advantage. But as it is, with g5, you're really just helping my knight to go where he's intending to with knight d5. So then we saw rook e d8, rook e d1. The black tries to harass us a little bit. Bishop g4, f3, bishop e6. But we're simply going to keep up with the plan now, b4. And uh, every every improving move we make on the queen side makes it more and more difficult for black. Now, there's also a tactical problem here for black in that if rook d7 now, we can play knight f4. And uh, if rook d2, we have knight e6 check with a very strong position. So black, unfortunately, finds himself for the first time in the game unable to make any useful moves. If he trades the knight, clearly our bishop will come back to life at some point with f4, and that's a bad business. And how is he to move on the queen side without further weakening himself? So black made a waiting move with h6. And the point was is that when we now strengthen our position with king f2, black can make a good move now and play rook d7. Because now knight f4 is not going to work due to rook takes d2 check. So, rook d7, and now I thought a very nice move from Smyslov, uh, which takes a lot of confidence, I think, to play this way. Simply knight c3. And what I mean by confidence is that Smyslov senses that even if all the rooks come off, which is in a, in a way a sad thing because our rooks were so much better than his rooks, but now they were obviously threatening to double, themselves. But even if we threaten, if we trade them all off, the problems of the black position, especially after white plays f4, are going to be too big to handle. And that's exactly what we see in this game. Rook d2, rook d2, rook d8, rook takes, knight takes, and now f4. Pawn takes, pawn takes, and we're threatening things like knight b5 to d4. So um, Saba plays bishop c4, king e3, king f6 looks all very natural. Black and white might want to play king c6, and now b5. Now, I think this is a good position to think about. Um, it turns out that black is basically completely lost here. And there's not much he can do about it. Um, and one of the things that I noticed with the Smyslov games is that we often have a situation where we're going to get a problem-like solution. And we see that in this game as well. Where What I mean by that problem-like or study-like is that We've played very nicely strategically to get this position, but in terms of finishing black off, we're going to find that there's some interesting geometries which are going to make it difficult for black to coordinate his poor pieces. And exploiting those geometries is going to be the key to finishing off the game. For example, if king 
E6, there's a problem that if we can move the bishop away, and uh, play c6, and pawn takes, pawn takes, and now king d6 is going to lose to knight b5. And I, should, I, I actually made a small mistake myself here in doing this game. Um, knight b5 isn't such a threat, so black actually played bishop d3, which is going to lead to a similar thing here. So, b5, and... And for the same reason king e6 isn't playable because of the knight b5 problem. But what it really illustrates the study-like nature of the position is after c6, king d6, black has this very nice shot, b6. The point being that uh, ba is too strong of a threat as well as pawn to c7, so it has to be taken. And now knight b5 ends the game because wherever the king moves... We have c7. And as we've noted in other lectures, the king is very poor at dealing with a pass, or the knight is very poor with dealing with a pass pawn. So, as it was, black had to play e5, but this makes things fairly simple for us. Knight e4 check, king e6, and now c6. So again, a study-like solution where now we have the knight c5 problem for black. Check. And now it's a bit of a mop-up operation because c7 is so powerful a threat it has to be taken. Knight c5. King d6. Knight takes. Pawn takes. Let's start advancing the pawn. We're going to queen now. Bishop takes. King takes. Simply king g4. Black tries the last attempt with b4, takes king b5, but after knight d4 he resigns because king takes pawn, will lose to knight c6, and will end up rounding up all of the, uh, both the f and the h pawns on the king's side, and will march the h pawn. So, this was one of just many beautiful games that Smyslov played that I found very instructive for my own games and also for my own aesthetic experience of the game of chess. And um, it's something that I've come back to and would like to pursue in these lectures, and I hope you join me for the following segments. Bye-bye. <laughs>